This is an unofficial, fan-made audiobook. All original stories are owned by Wizards of the Coast. If you are enjoying these stories, please consider subscribing to my Patreon over at patreon.com slash voxoraculum for some special, patron-exclusive content. Thanks. On with the story. Zergo, Khan of the Mardu, knows how to nurse a grudge. And there's no one he hates more than the planeswalker Sarkhan Vol, a former Mardu who burned his own clanmates with dragonfire when his spark ignited. But what lengths will he go to for revenge? Zergo Helmsmasher stood on a rocky outcropping at the edge of a jagged plateau, surveying the assembled multitudes of the Mardu below him on the plain. Spread out among them, were the corpses of many warriors. Some were Mardu, but the great majority were Teemer. To the left of the army lay endless, windswept scrubland, the home territory of his people. To the right lay the beginnings of the Teemer foothills, where the Teemer force he had just defeated had come from. While he surveyed his army, his army watched him as well. They looked at him with triumph and weariness and expectation. We are Mardu, he shouted. Mardu, they returned, and they cheered as one for several seconds. He drank in their unified exultation until the roar quieted. Surak has tested our borders, he shouted. We have shown him that they are strong. Perhaps he thought that we were sitting idle at Wing Throne. He is wrong. We are Mardu, and we rule these plains. Zergo stomped his great foot, and the multitudes cheered again. As they cheered, a low cracking sound came from the rock below him. He looked down and saw a jagged line had appeared beneath his feet. The cracking sound continued. Zergo took two steps backwards, and a moment later the forward part of the outcropping broke off and fell to the ground with a great thump. As the cheer died down, a shrill voice coming from down on the plain reached Zergo's ears. Warriors near its source were turning to face it with worried, confused faces. Zergo turned to Varuk, an old but clever orc standing nearby, who served as Zergo's closest advisor, and asked, What is that? Varuk swiveled his ears forward. It is a goblin, my Khan. He is angry. Zergo sniffed. Bring him here. Varuk gave him a quick but nervous look. Your will, my Khan. He looked at a nearby human guard and snapped his fingers, and she took off running toward the disturbance. By the time she returned to Zergo with the goblin, the plane was silent once again. The army watched as Zergo peered down at the little ball of fuzz. Zergo opened his mouth to speak, but the goblin was too fast. My sister died to take this rock, and you broke it! The goblin's squeaky voice somehow carried across the silent plain as the crowd began to shift uncomfortably. Zergo stood as tall as he could. We were victorious over the teamer because we fought as one mind, one body, one clan. Death in battle is a great glory if it serves the clan. Your sister's brave sacrifice saved many Mardu lives. Varuk raised his weapon and shouted a cheer. In answer, the multitude raised its weapons to the sky and matched it. Their unified voice washed over the plateau and dissipated. Then you broke it! The goblin looked down at where the section now lay in the foot of the plateau, then returned its defiant gaze to him. It was a good rock! The pathetic goblin stared up at Zergo as its squeaky voice ran out across the silent plain. 
The warriors closest to Zergo were edging forward, and their faces were cold and angry as they began to mutter among themselves. Rage welled in Zergo's heart. You think I do not command what is best for the Mardu? My sister died for nothing, it squeaked. Zergo raised his left foot as high as he could, then stomped on the goblin, dropping all of his weight on it. It flattened neatly to the ground with a satisfying crunch. Zergo returned his attention to the multitudes. We have no need for this rock, or any other. We move, we take, we eat. We are Mardu, and we have shown Surek our might. The army roared one more time, although this time it was not quite as loud. Zergo turned away from the crowd, and the dull roar of conversation began below him. As the army's attention dispersed, Varuk approached Zergo with a slightly lowered head, and indicated the crushed goblin's corpse. I'm not certain it was wise to kill the goblin. It threatened my authority, and without unity we are nothing. Something flashed in Varuk's eyes. Is this more important than your position? His family will resent you. A warrior wearing a messenger's banner cut her way through the crowd around Zergo, and stopped breathlessly in front of him. I know why, she panted. They attacked us. A Timur scout saw one of us in the forest, beyond our borders. Zergo snapped to face her. What? She took a step back. They surrounded him. He called himself Sakan. The Timur were insulted that he claimed rule over them, and they demanded that he surrender. She stood there saying nothing. Zergo snorted. And? He... They say he turned into a dragon, and breathed fire on them, took off and flew further into Timur territory. Vol. It could only be Vol. Zergo's eyes narrowed. They assumed it was the new Khan of the Madu. And so they attacked, while their enemy leader was elsewhere. Except you weren't. And you can't turn into a dragon. She looked down for a moment, then back up with questioning eyes. Right? You are dismissed, Zergo bellowed. As she scurried away, Varuk approached closely, head bowed. You should not chase him. Zergo looked down at him. He has threatened this clan enough. He must die. Varuk tilted his head to one side, a bit bolder now. You forget how long I've been at your side. I remember when you were just a wing leader. I was there when Vol deserted, and expected to be welcomed with open arms when he returned. I was there when you sent him into battle against the Sultai. I was there when he turned into a great flying beast of flame, and roasted your army with his breath. I know what he can do, and he is too much for you. He called himself Sarkhan, and that is why Surak attacked us. You think the next Khan who hears this name will laugh and slap her thigh when she hears this claim? No, this will not be the last time we're attacked because of his treachery. After a defeat of this size, Surak must leave us alone for some time. Our horses do not do well in the mountains, and Vol is moving away from us. He is a traitor and a threat and I will see him dead. Varuk turned his head to face the army, which was now a good deal of the way into pitching camp. How will you convince the rest of them to go? They do not share your history. Zergo sneered. Tonight we celebrate. 
tomorrow we prepare. The next day, we punish Surak for his impudence. Tell the rest of them. Guruk nodded and disappeared into the raucous crowd. Zergo's horde spent the night in celebration. Zergo himself remained in his tent, allowing them their triumph. He was livid with Vol, and any warrior who saw him in this state would assume that he was angry at one of the Mardu instead. Only a veteran few of his warriors still desired revenge on Vol, and so Surak's head would have to be enough to lead his army into the mountains. He could say now that he was angry with Surak, but that would not work until the glory of the victory had faded. So he remained alone. The next day, the Mardu prepared to move. Zergo's warriors scoured the corpses of the fallen for supplies, and made great piles of their bodies. Shamans created great chasms underneath the piles, and closed them again once the mass graves were full. Scouts probed the edges of the wooded foothills adjacent to the plains, and the three top wing leaders of his army attended Zergo to his tent. Tomorrow we move into the mountains, he said to them. We will punish Surak for his impudence. The Tima fare best in their mountains, the Rook said. This path is dangerous. We have scouts, Zergo said. We will be prepared when the enemy strikes. They do not know Timur lands, said a female orc named Vrufaz, her eyes wide with confusion. We will be blind in comparison to our enemies. Zergo glared at her. You should have more confidence in our warriors. We have punished Surak enough, said a male human named Batar. His lowered black eyebrows and moustached sneer, thick with disdain. Risking so much to punish him more is foolish. Zergo's face twisted. I am Khan of the Mardu. You will do as I say. Vruk nodded, and then Rufaz nodded. After a few moments, Batar nodded too, and they all left. By the time he rejoined the army, all three of them had begun to prepare his horde for the next day's travel. The next morning, Zergo's army packed its tents, mounted its horses and riding beasts, and began to move. He sent scouts ahead to probe the forest for Tima. I also heard reports of a Mardu deserter, he said to the scouts. If you find him, do not chase him, but tell me. They nodded, and dispersed into the woods. Zergo travelled in the centre of the horde, his riding beast towering over the horses of the army around him. It struggled a little in the hills, although not as much as the horses. His first wave of scouts returned with vague but disquieting news. The teamer were nearby, it was certain, but none had actually been seen. The scouts had only found broken branches, snapped twigs, fresh footprints that the Mardu had not made. Surak was sure to know where they were. Three hours later, the Mardu army entered a valley that zigzagged up the mountain. A sudden chill fell over them, and it began to snow. It was an unnatural, driving, insistent snow that coated the ground in minutes, even though they were far below the elevation where one would expect snow. His horde's mounts, horses and beasts alike, struggled to slog through the piled powder. A few scouts returned from forays into the forest, with little to no information. One of them caught a glance of a team of shaman, doing what looked like some kind of weather magic, but this was hardly a revelation to anyone. Batar rode up next to Zergo, his horse shifting uncomfortably in the snow. My Khan, we must turn back. This is absurd. We are riding into a trap. Zergo considered him for a moment. A threat to the unity of this clan hides in these mountains. Would you not see it stamped out? Batar sneered. 
This snow threatens our unity. Zergo sat up in his saddle and glared at Batal with all of his might. A little snow should not threaten a Mardu warrior, Batar, throat slasher. Batar huffed and rode away from Zergo. After only fifteen feet, Zergo could not see him anymore. A scout ran up to him, her whole body covered with a fine layer of snow. There are Tima nearby. They were massing at the top of the hill, above us. Perhaps a hundred of them. Zergo's breath clouded in the unnatural cold. Tell the others to prepare for... The sounds of battle surrounded them. The clash of steel on steel, shouts of triumph and death. The great wet sounds of slain riding beasts came from both behind him and in front of him in the near distance. He couldn't see far enough in snow to know what was going on. He dismounted and ran forward. Perhaps two hundred feet ahead of where he had been, fifteen fur-clad Tima stood surrounded by many Mardu corpses and more Mardu warriors. The Mardu closed in, and soon all of the Mardu had been slain, and then all was quiet. The snowfall stopped. What happened? Zergo bellowed. Sounds of running came from behind Zergo. He turned and saw a scout approaching him. Two breaches, she said, panting. This one here, and another one, five hundred feet back. Fifty teamer, arranged in a column, broke into our line, killed fifty-six, and disappeared back into the woods. We were not prepared to chase them. They left eleven corpses behind. Zergo turned back to the scene in front of him. And what happened here? The same, said a female orc who stood nearby, with two bright red cuts across her face. She surveyed what was now a clearing full of corpses in the centre of the Mardu marching line. I'd say about fifty dead Mardu, and I only see eight, Tima. You and you, he said, pointing to each of them. Show me where they came from. The rest of you, clean this up. Both the scout and the orc led him to the edge of the valley, where each path led up a steep slope. Each was steeper than any Mardu horse could climb, and only wide enough for perhaps five warriors across. The Tima had hit him twice in the dead centre of his army, with a small enough force to fit through that passage, and they had disappeared back into the woods like water. He squinted and held his hand above his eyes, but could not see any further up either path. When he returned to his lines, a scout was waiting for him. What would you have us do? Collect them, he said. Mass the army here, and I will address them. The scout scurried away. Nearby, three young warriors sat in the snow, talking. They came out of the woods, out of nowhere, one young man said and then they were gone as quickly. My brother spouted four arrows and died in front of me. I could not reach his killer, cried a second young man. This could happen five more times, and it would work just as well, said a young woman next to him. We do not know this terrain. Zergo pushed his way through the crowd and swaggered up to them. They stopped talking and stood. Tell me. Zergo said. Was this your first battle? All three looked up to him and nodded. And did you each kill an enemy? They nodded again and stood, their faces now expectant. You! Zergo bellowed, pointing at one of them. How did you slay your foe? Silence began to spread around them. I removed her head he said, with one clean cut. Head taker, Zergo decreed. He turned to the next, who trembled with wide eyes. And you? They stood taller now. I put three arrows in her chest, she said. 
heart piercer. Zergo turned to the last. We had lost our weapons and were wrestling, he said. I crushed his throat with my bare hands. Neck ringer, Zergo bellowed. The three of them bowed, each glowing. By then, much of the army had massed around him, and many warriors were filling in around the edges of what he could see. Zergo raised his sword to the sky. To the warriors of the Mardu, and their victory. The horde cheered on command, but not as loudly as Zergo had hoped. No, came a shout from nearby, and Batar stepped out of the crowd. His face was red, his muscles were tight, and his eyes were angry. These young warriors were right. You led us into this forest to punish Sorak, you say, but you do not know where he is. And this is bad ground. And this is unnatural snow. And yet we continue. You must have other reasons. And you have not spoken of them to us. And now, many of us have died. I challenge you for the right to lead this clan. All motions stopped. All eyes came to rest on the two of them. Zergo took his measure. The man was angry and stupid in his rage. Were he thinking about the good of the clan around him, he would not have done this. Zergo had no choice now but to kill him. Fine. Zergo shrugged and drew his sword. The little man was defiant, a shield in each hand. Three great bone dragon claws were lashed to each shield. His weapons were impressive to the eye, but for a little human, they would be heavy and slow. Come show us, Zergo said, how great a warrior you are. Batar sneered. With his heavy weapons, he must have wished Zergo would come to him. But Zergo would not. Batar could not wait lest he look weak. The man loped forward, holding both shields at his sides. Zergo waited for him. When he got close, he thrust at Zergo with his right shield, but Zergo dodged left, putting himself nearly behind the man. He cut for Batar's neck with the sword in his left hand, but Batar raised the hand that had just thrusted for Zergo's chest with surprising speed. Zergo's sword impacted on the man's forearm armour, denting it, but doing no real damage. Then the other shield came hurtling towards Zergo from under Batar's raised right arm. One claw pointed at his face, and the other at his groin. Zergo spun away from the attack fast enough that he impacted only the armour on his leg and shoulder, tearing a few plates out of each. He kept moving further behind Batar, putting the man's awkwardly raised right shield further out of position. As he moved, he cocked his right arm for a punch. Batar kept spinning to match him, guarding his face with his right shield. But the instant he let his guard drop, Zergo's fist slammed into his chin. Batar slumped to the ground, groaning. Zergo grasped Batar by the neck, and lifted him off the ground. Batar struggled some, dangling like a child's doll as he gasped for air. Zergo ran his sword straight through Batar's chest, threw the limp form to the ground, and stomped his great foot on the man's head. Bright red gore splattered in the white snow around them. He turned slowly, surveying all around him. See what happens to those who challenge the Khan of the Mardu. Baruch rode into the clearing. It will not happen again, he said. I will kill anyone who dares, Zergo roared, thrusting his blood-soaked blade to the sky. No, Baruch said, dismounting. Because there's nothing more to challenge. 
His eyes were hard and cold, and he stood straighter than ever before, in defiance, not submission. Zergo's eyes narrowed. I right here, he bellowed. The rook motioned with one arm toward what remained of the horde. Look at them, Zergo. His voice echoed through the valley. They once served you. Now, they only fear you. And that means you're not truly their Khan. You challenge my authority? Zergo bellowed. There is nothing to challenge, he said. He turned his whole body to face the horde. The Mardu have no quarrel with Surak. Return to our home at Wingthrow with me, the Rook said. And we will no longer risk our lives in service of this one foolish orc's desire for revenge. The horde cheered its assent. Zergo stared at them with wide eyes and a gaping jaw. The Rook turned to look at Zergo once again. There was a moment of what might have been remorse. But then, there was nothing. The Rook climbed back onto his mount and rode back down the valley through the centre of the army. Zergo stood and watched as his army turned away from him and slowly followed behind the Rook. And then, there were only banners in the distance. The clan was gone, and Varuk was right. They were not truly Zergos anymore. He only had one thing left to give the Mardu, and that was Vol's head lying motionless in the snow. He looked down at his sword, which was still covered in Batar's glistening blood. He loped toward a corpse that had a dry shirt, and ripped a piece of it off with his right hand, but stopped, just short of wiping his blade clean. That blood was all he had left. He would not clean it until it had mixed with the vols. A nearby fur-clad body, with three arrows stuck in it, shifted and groaned. He padded over to it, and held his dripping sword at the dying human's throat. You, he said, tell me, when your people last saw the Khan of the Mardu, where was he going? Her eyes bugged. She feebly pointed a finger further up the mountains. The spirit, she croaked. Dragon's doom, she heaved. He plunged his sword into the woman's throat, and she stopped moving. Zergo returned to his mount, climbed into the saddle, and rode for the chasm. Zergo knew where the dragon's tomb was rumoured to be, but it would be a dangerous trip. If Vol could turn into a dragon, though, it made some sense that he would seek it out. The ground grew increasingly treacherous as he rode in the direction of the chasm where the dragon's body lay. He rode over several steep hills and into the beginning of the night. Soon after twilight, his mount lurched and heaved, groaned and stopped, and nearly fell over. He dismounted. The beast had missed a step and broken a front leg, which now bent at an unnatural angle. Great shards of bone protruded from its skin, and shifted slightly as the thing yowled in pain. Zergo left it to die, and continued alone.